Hello my friends and welcome to another Sinic video. Today we're going to be looking at the topic of ecology. So this is the third topic of all of paper 2 for biology and it's quite a big one. So get ready. So ecology is the study of ecosystems which is basically the an area and the interaction of all the things living and non-living in that area. So it could be the community of living things um, and the non-living things too that define that place uh, and in this location to survive and reproduce the organisms that are there need a supply of materials from their surroundings and from other living organisms to help them to survive so ultimately the study of ecology is the study of living things and everything around them and all of the interactions and and processes that happen to help them to live so within an ecosystem we have in the biotic part we have competition and competition is um, basically the fighting for things, resources, mates, uh, food, space, shelter that animals and plants will do and this will lead to the change in, in distribution and abundance of different species which is what some of the field studies data will be trying to measure. So competition can lead to the change in distribution which is how things are spread and the abundance is just how many things, I suppose abundance is the same, it's how, how common or rare they are. Um, the other thing to know in ecosystems is that species are interdependent, which means that they rely on each other, dependent upon other things. Inter means between different species or different things, different, different species, different each other. Um, so they rely on each other for services, so that can be pollination, it could be that um, they rely on them to help with digestion of food or for providing shelter or protection, whatever it is. And also the final concept in ecosystems is that in, an, in a stable community, a stable ecosystem, a stable community is a population of a species in that, in that ecosystem, is where all the factors are in balance, so their population size remains fairly constant. That's not true to say that they are constant, they fairly constant means they fluctuate but they remain around the same average. Um, it's normal for populations to fluctuate, uh, they go through cycles but they should remain the same on average over a long period of time. Now we spoke about biotic and abiotic factors earlier, some examples of biotic factors uh, are the living factors and the abiotic factors are the non-living. So factors that might affect where, where animals are found or plants are found in an ecosystem that are biotic ones are things like pre predators, the presence of them. It might also be the prey, the food accessibility that they have. Uh, it might be things like disease. It might be the presence of hosts for organisms. Um, could be the presence of mates. A whole number of things, but they have to be related to living organisms. So all of those relate to factors that are linked to living organisms. Non-living factors, however, can be anything that is not living that would affect the distribution of an organism. So a standard one to think about would be temperature, temperature, uh, pH of soil. Uh, we could have the nutrient contents of the soil. We could have uh, humidity. We could have light intensity, a whole number of things, wind speed. Now, you're going to have to be able to suggest how to measure some of these, like a temperature would be you'd use a thermometer to measure the light intensity, you'd use a light meter to measure the pH of the soil, you'd have a pH meter to measure the wind speed, you'd use a wind speed meter. Um, logical things really to measure the nutrients of a soil a bit more tricky uh, linked to chemistry I suppose would be taking the soil uh, drying it out completely and then doing chemical tests on it to see what's present but it's logical but all of these things will lead to a change in the distribution or abundance of different species and ultimately that's what we're trying to study here now, in the previous topic, you would have come across evolution and natural selection, and they lead to these things that we call adaptations. But adaptations aren't something that animals and organisms have chosen to have. <clears throat> they have what are they? They've developed over millions of years, potentially, uh, to have which help them to survive in a particular environment. Uh, they fill a, a niche, a particular role in their environment. Um, but we need to know about these adaptations and how to describe them. 
So they have features basically which enable them to survive better. And these can either be structural, behavioral, or functional. So structural would be, for example, uh, the actual spines on a cactus. Behavioral would be an owl um, sleeping at in, a, in the daytime and hunting at night so that they can access um, prey who are out at night time and that's a very niche role there aren't many predators that hunt at night time and functional might be something to do with their body about how it works and in its internals about then how it's adapted um, so for example uh, bacteria that live in hydrothermal vents have enzymes which are adapted to working at high temperature that's a functional adaptation these extremophiles as, as I said just now are like that bacteria are organisms which live in really extreme environments of extreme conditions so it might be that they are adapted to living in places that have high temperature or pressure um, or that they can cope with really strong salt concentrations and even though they're living in these very salty areas they um, their cells can cope but if you took for example a freshwater fish and you put it into a salt water area uh, it wouldn't it wouldn't be able to cope so these things are called extremophiles so just animals or, or plants organisms that um, are well adapted to extreme conditions the next area we're going to look at is the area of field work, so how we can measure population or distribution of particular species. And there are two methods we can take with this. The first is when we are approximating the population in a set area, and that's just a population of one species, um, perhaps comparing two areas like um, a forest or a field. And you might be looking at how many um, animals around. Apologies for if, if you can hear my family in the background. We're all trying to uh, make do in this quarantine. Um, and the second type of test in the, in the location is measuring the change in population or distribution across the location. So that's as we're moving from one part to another. As we move up this slope, for example, into the mountains, how does the distribution of um, conifer trees change? Or how do the the population of hares change as we go up this mountain? Um, so it's measuring a change along a transect, we call that. Whereas this is just, for um, test A, it's just comparing location A with location B. With test B, it's, location, it's comparing basically as we move from A into B, how does it change? So the methods that we use are, are slightly different, but both use a quadrat, which is a regularly shaped square, um, and it has maybe 50 centimetre lengths on each side and 0.5 metre lengths on each side. That Ivy's crying. Um, but in uh, this first trial, for measuring uh, the differences in the field and the forest, we need to use a random coordinate generator. And she they're basically we would place them randomly to eliminate bias. You know, if you're going to look at how many daisies are present in a field and you walk into a field with a quadrat, it's really tempting to put it down somewhere where there are loads of daisies because it's like, oh, look at all these daisies, they're so pretty. Um, but we can't do that. If we want to accurately, or as best we can, estimate how many daisies are in this field, we need to randomly place it. So you get a map of the area, you create some coordinates across that, a grid, and you randomly generate some coordinates for that location. And in that quadrat, you might count population, or you might ca count like how many daisies there are, or you might do a percentage cover. So um, if you've got your quadrat here, and perhaps you know, you've know you got coverage like this, you might say that perhaps um, it's covering this much, perhaps that's 40% of the quadrat that's covered, and that's your percentage cover you, re you would record. So you take across your location, you maybe do 10 repeats. The more you do, the more accurate it's going to be. And with that, you calculate a mean. So you find out in, in one meter squared, for example, uh, maybe you have four daisies on average. Um, and with this, you can then estimate how many there are in the whole field. So you would scale that up from being one meter squared to being, uh, let's say, a thousand meters squared. And if we know that on average, in one meter squared, there are four, if we multiply that up to a thousand of them, there'd be 4,000 across the whole field. It's a nice logical way, and it just saves time. The reason we do this estimation rather than counting all the daisies, it saves time. Um, if we want to know on average how many uh, orangutan are in the whole of Borneo, we do random calculation, random coordinates across the whole of Borneo. Um, we sample uh, maybe 
a 500 meter squared area, um, a mile squared, count how many orangutans are in these locations, and then we scale that up to the whole of Borneo. So we don't really know when we estimate how many orangutans are in the whole world. We haven't gone out and individually counted them, but we've estimated it based on this, this technique. They're being very loud now. Uh, for the second technique here, for a transect, when we're measuring it across a change across uh, a location, we need to place quadrats at regular intervals. So as we move up this slope, we're going to place one, two, three, four, five, for example, and we place a quadrat on this this tape measure that we've laid down at, um, up this hill. And we would again maybe count the population, or we'd look at the percentage cover. Um, if we wanted to look at how much grass there is covering our quadrat as we move up the hill, you'd do ex exactly that. Um, however, we can still add this idea of being random um, by running other transects up the same hill. Um, if you imagine moving 20 metres down, uh, down the hill and running another transect, you could do um, a, a, all the way around this mountain. If you look at it from a bird's eye view, you've got a mountain like this, runs up to the peak like that. Um, you could count the degrees around this mountain um, and you could just randomly generate some some numbers in those those very 360 degrees to run random quadrats uh, ra random transects sorry um, at different locations and that would give you lots of data that you could again take um, a mean from when we're studying ecosystems we really want to think about how to define different organisms within these ecosystems so we look at um, the different levels that organisms will fall into be it right at the bottom of the producers or right at the top of the consumers. Now producers are what we consider first. These are usually green plants or algae. Um, these things will basically be producing biomass and biomass is referring to things like sugars. So for example plants or algae will do the process of photosynthesis and they will take CO2 and H2O, as you've seen from the bioenergetics topic, and they'll produce sugars, primarily glucose. And that is the feedstock, if you like, for the rest of the ecosystem. They are the producers of biomass that can be transferred through different levels of consumers. So they will pass it down a food chain, um, or more realistically, a food web, a food chain. You have a producer which is um, passing energy to a primary consumer, which is passing energy to a secondary consumer, to a tertiary consumer and so on. In a food web, you might have um, a couple of primary consumers or three or four secondary consumers. Uh, you have your producer down here. You've got your primaries, um, you've got your secondaries um, and they're all kind of webbed together. You might have um, a, a secondary that also eats uh, uh, another secondary consumer. So technically it could be a secondary or th tertiary consumer. Um, and you might have then the apex kind of predator, if you like, the top predator, the top consumer that is um, not being eaten by anything else. And so this basically shows us how energy is flowing. Biomass contains energy. This is where we're getting our energy from. And the energy is passing between these different stages. And so the experiment that we looked at just now uh, is a way of kind of in investigating what levels of organism organization are, are present in um, an ecosystem. And uh, this is a way of kind of explaining the relationships in terms of energy transfers. And when we're on the topic of predators and prey, a little extra bit of information that we need to know is that the populations of predator and prey will tend to kind of rise and fall in a relationship which um, ends up being cyclical. So if you think of a relationship of like hares and wolves um, if you have some hares or rabbits or whatever that sort of uh, primary consumer kind of level they're going to eat a lot of grass and as they eat they're going to be able to reproduce and produce more offspring um, and their population is going to increase now um, a fox or a, a wolf will start off having a certain number and because the number of hare or rabbit are increasing their population is also going to increase um, because there's more food around. But because their population is increasing, there are going to be more wolves around, so they're going to be eating more of the rabbits, more of the hares. So the number of hares and rabbits starts to decrease um, until the point at which they're kind of back to this low level. And because the number of rabbits and hares have decreased, it's going to be less food for, rabbit, uh, for the wolves to eat, so their population is going to decrease too. And you end up with this very cyclical um, population rise and fall. You just need to know that 
that's what's happening. We've got a delayed increase for the predator, which as they eat more of the prey, the prey's population drops off, so they've got less food for themselves, so their population is going to decrease too. And you'll probably get given a graph that you need to describe and maybe explain in terms of populations and the food availability. Now in biology, as a separate sciences idea, we're stretching the trophic levels, um, stretching the organisation tiers uh, to a slightly different concept which is how we can name them producers yes but then also uh, tertiary primary secondary and tertiary consumers primary being first secondary obviously and tertiary being third um, the thing to consider here really though is the energy flow and how typically in each of these transitions or transfers of energy only about 10 percent of the original energy is passed on so if the producer is has say 100 joules this is uh, much lower than it would normally be, but if it has 100 joules, only 10 joules will be passed on to the next consumer. Um, and then of those 10 joules that exist here for the primary consumer, only one joule will be passed on to the secondary, um, and therefore only 0.1 joules will be passed on to the third, the tertiary consumer. And what you're seeing here basically is how there is a lot of energy in the producer tier, um, but a lot of it is being lost through each, each transfer. Uh, which is it kind of explains why we can't have then a quaternary consumer because a quaternary consumer would have to be eating um, relatively so much more of the higher tiers or lower tiers depending on how you look at the numbers um, to get the energy that it needs to survive and it wouldn't be stable for itself or for the ecosystem um, but the reasons why that energy transfer is so low uh, are for m multitude of reasons. Firstly, that producer or that organism is going to be doing respiration itself. So it's going to be using energy and releasing the energy as heat to its surroundings. Um, it's also going to be producing waste, depending on the organism. This might be like feces. It might be um, that it sheds leaves. It loses leaves as dead organic matter. It might be that... Um, actually not all of the uh, organism is being eaten so not all eaten if you think of uh, a lion that's eating a zebra it won't eat every single bit of the the, um, the tissue it won't eat the bones it won't be able to digest everything if a consumer is eating a producer it won't be able to digest all of the uh, the cellulose from the cell walls I mean if you ate some uh, sweet corn you don't tend to digest much of the, sh the shell of the sweet corn, you'll digest the kind of uh, liquid that's in the inside um, and the, the matter that's inside it, the cellulose, you cannot digest. So there are a multitude of reasons why only 10% of the energy is passed on. And we can represent this, this energy level for each tier with a pyramid of biomass. And this is a skill that you need to be able to um, do. And pyramid of biomass is a way of representing basically how much energy is found in each tier. And we do that by representing its biomass. So this is the dried matter that is within all the organisms in an ecosystem of that tier. So in this first tier, you would have the producer. The second tier, you'd have the primary consumer, then the secondary consumer, then the tertiary consumer. And so the biomass represents almost how much energy they have. It should show that there is a loss of energy between each tier, which it does. It's not 10% of each one previously, um, but that's because we're talking about individual organism, organisms here, um, but it is a significant change. And you need to be able to draw one of these. So what is different in this compared to a normal graph um, is that you represent your bar firstly horizontally, and it is averaged out across this midpoint. So you've got your x-axis and your y-axis is right down the middle. Um, so the length of this bar is to scale compared to the one above and above that and above that um, as a visual representation, as I say, of the biomass of each tier. Um, you'll usually get given a box to draw it in. You might not necessarily be given the axes already drawn, um, so it's a good skill to practice um, and you can find exam questions online if you do a good search for it. Now, while we have a simple food chain to consider, at GCSC level, materials aren't just cycling and through a food chain and then stopping. There's got to be more levels than that. There's got to be more depth. Um, so what we're going to look at here is how carbon and water, only briefly, are cycled through um, an ecosystem. So the first thing that we know is that we have CO2. So if we start with 
with carbon dioxide. CO2 is found in the atmosphere, it's taken into producers. Producers will turn that into um, biomass, they'll turn it into glucose, and those producers will then pass it on to consumers. Wonderfully simple. That That's the part that you would have got from like year six um, primary school. You know about consumption of plants, so herbivores will eat plants, that will be eaten by predators and it's the spread of material and energy down that chain and that the CO2 producing that biomass um, is coming from the atmosphere. Okay, now remember that from a bioenergetics topic, producers, that's plants and consumers, they both are doing a process called respiration and as they do the process of respiration they are producing CO2 once again. So these two are also producing respiration, producing CO2 through respiration um, to feed it back into the atmosphere. And of course we should really la label um, this process of photosynthesis here too. So that's the basic part of what you would have seen before. The extra bit that we're going to add in here is where the rest of the material of producers and consumers will go after they die or they produce waste which is critical because if the plant is eaten not all of the plant will be eaten um, and if a consumer is being eaten it, not all of it's going to be eaten if it dies it, it, it's not all going to get eaten by um, a large other predator either so it ends up going to uh, thing called, things called detritivores which eat what we call detritus. So these produce waste and these detritivores and decomposers will essentially eat the waste material. And what they will do is they, they will do the same process as the consumers and the producers. They will do this process of respiration. They'll use the energy in the biomass that they've eaten and they'll get the energy out of it and they'll release CO2. So they are in effect producing um, CO2 as well. And that's the cyclical nature of carbon. Super simple. Now, obviously, there are extra things that we as humans are doing. So we're burning things like fossil fuels because sometimes when um, organisms do decay and, and die and they get locked into the land um, in certain conditions, they might form fossil fuels. So these things uh, might contribute to fossil fuels. We are then burning them after millions of years of formation. We're releasing them in an instant. Um, but really that's the carbon cycle. The main processes you need to consider are respiration and photosynthesis and think about where they fit in this cycle. Um, the carbon cycle is a really good question to come up in a kind of long answer, four mark, six mark kind of question. They usually give you some kind of information to describe, to talk about, um, but don't be surprised if you're just given a question straight up that you need to describe and state the processes in um, the carbon cycle but always come back to respiration and photosynthesis. And if you're getting those two described, you're talking about its products um, and its reactants, so what it needs and what it produces, uh, you're probably going to be on track for about four marks already. And if you can throw in the words like detritivores, decomposers, maybe fossil fuels, if it allows you to do that in the question, you're probably going to be stretching for then um, six marks. Good. The water cycle, similarly, uh, really simple. I mean, you, again, we'll have come across this in, in primary school. Uh, you've got to talk about things like evaporation and condensation. Um, I mean, I don't need to really go into too much detail here, I hope. Um, plants will take in water. You know the keyword transpiration. They'll take in water through their roots, fresh water. Uh, that will be carried up via osmosis through the roots, through to the stems, to the leaves, um, where the leaves will then lose some water through the stomata because of evaporation. Um, that will then form part of the clouds where it will condense, it will rain, um, and so on and so forth. Uh, eventually it might drain to the sea where it will continuously be evaporated um, and then precipitated, which is the rain part. Now a critical part of the carbon cycle and recycling of nutrients is decomposition. It's the job of decomposers, detritivores, breaking down um, large waste material, dead matter, into smaller parts and smaller parts and smaller parts until we get to and breaking down biological materials, um, biological molecules, so carbohydrates, lipids, proteins, um, into the tiniest components like amino acids, um, mineral ions, uh, and eventually forming things like nitrates, 
that can then be absorbed into plants to form uh, healthy plants which then pass nutrients and minerals back through the, the food chain. Um, now we need to know a few things about decomposition, primarily uh, how it's affected, so what processes or the conditions will help it. Um, so first up, a lot of these organisms need a nice concentration of oxygen to do aerobic di digestion. There are those that do um, do uh, decompose decomposing without oxygen, which is anaerobic decomposition. They also need a, a decent temperature, so a nice warm place. If it's too cold, they'll work more slowly. If it's too hot, uh, they're enzymes will denature. Um, and they need a good supply of water so that they can um, have the molecules dissolve and the enzymes dissolve uh, or be carried by a solvent, which water does very well. Um, if we change the conditions slightly, we can manipulate the decomposers to produce methane. So we can actually produce something called a biogas. Um, biogas is basically methane gas, which is produced biologically. Um, when you look in chemistry at one of the later topics, you look at how we can use and treat sewage. And part of that sewage treatment process is using um, anaerobic decay to produce methane. Wonderful gas we can use to produce energy uh, as a fuel. And there's also a required practical here uh, where we need to be able to investigate the effect of changing temperature on the decay of milk uh, by measuring the pH change. And the key thing to this to remember is that in milk you have lipids and lipids are made up of glycerol with then fatty acid chains. And when you break down milk, so if you let milk be decomposed, you're going to break these chains and by breaking these chains you're producing um, fatty acids and these fatty acids uh, are obviously acidic and so if you have an increased release of those you have a lower pH and so by lowering the pH you can then and, and monitoring the pH you can detect how quickly it's being decomposed so you would change the temperature that's your independent variable uh, what you're measuring is your dependent variable and you need to keep everything else the same so the oxygen concentration um, how quickly the water would evaporate if you're going to let it evaporate you could put it in um, uh, a sealed container just making sure that you open it regularly to get oxygen flow um, and then you'd measure the the ph but possibly if you can using um, a ph probe because it's more accurate than something like universal indicator which is quite subjective in judging how um, its ph has changed you could use litmus paper and things as well but ph probe is the best um, usually fairly high resolution as well which means how many decimal places uh, the reading of the ph will go to and you just want to track that over a number of days um, to see how it changes. The one that increases, uh, or de sorry, decreases its pH the fastest uh, is the fastest rate of decay. Now, while we've looked at how we can measure ecosystems, the final section of this topic is really um, how the environment is changing and what impact that's having on the world. Um, so this is really the, the large scale consideration of how humans are, are causing change. Now this is biology higher tier only, um, I don't really know why, it's not a difficult concept, um, but I guess the explanations that you need to give and how you're applying it to a context um, are slightly more complicated. It's, there's not a lot, lot to consider though here really, what you need to be able to do is really problem solve, read the question thoroughly um, and apply a bit of common sense. So they might give you a species of green sea turtle, snow leopard, monarch butterfly, whatever, um, and they want you to think about perhaps uh, the factors that might affect the distribution of the species. So for example, um, it might be things like temperature, which obviously links to global warming. It might be the availability of water, um, so looking at the consequences of things like drought or flooding. Um, it might be the composition of atmospheric gases, so CO2 levels changing. Um, simple. The changes though that cause the change in their distribution, um, distribution remember is where they're found, um, could be seasonal. So this could be looking at how um, seasonal changes in temperature will affect the distribution of, um, I don't know, a grizzly bear. Or uh, geographic might be um, literally whether there's a set of mountains in the way, which means that a population is spread or a river, um, or it could be human caused, which is what we're most focused on here and probably most likely to get asked as a question. And the biggest worry that we have in terms of danger to our planet is the loss of biodiversity. Um, so biodiversity is the variety of all the different species of organism on Earth or within an ecosystem. So it could be just focused on a uh, rainforest in Borneo, it could be focusing on the whole planet. But basically, if we have stability um, in 
our biodiversity, so in the spread of different types of, of species, um, in the diversity within that species too, we're more likely to have also stability in terms of ecosystems because it reduces uh, if the dependence on of one species on another by having a large amount of diversity in organisms um, there's a lot of reliability through lots of different relationships lots of different food um, sources and pollination sources and things like that and really as a future for us we depend upon a good level of biodiversity but there are loads of things that we are doing to counter it um, and these are just some of the ones that you need to know of. These are the ones that are in the specification. Um, and there are obviously other ones that they might throw in as context. So to begin with, we've got pollution, which can be uh, a multitude of layers. So we could look at it in terms of water. We could look at it in terms of air and we can look at it in terms of land. In water, we're producing things like sewage. We've got fertilizers. We've got toxic chemicals, all of which can lead to um, horrible things like water uh, having sewage in it and fertilizer in it can lead to a higher rate of decay um, because there are more organisms than breaking that down they will use up oxygen from that water um, potentially leading to um, a loss of life in in a lake or pond they're in because there's less, less oxygen available to those other organisms in it it's mad um toxic chemicals obviously speak for itself <laughs> not a good thing at all uh air is pollution in terms of smoke, so literally visible pollution uh, can affect your, your lung quality by breathing in too much uh, air pollution and also can lead to acid rain where we've got gases like sulfur dioxide being produced um, and that obviously then rains down leading to water pollution. Nasty. But you do look at that in a little bit more detail in chemistry. And land pollution, uh, things like landfill, again, toxic chemicals. If that leaches into soil, we've got an issue in terms of agriculture. Not good. In land use, land use is basically how we are not deforesting. That's a different thing. But land use in terms of how we're building, quarrying, farming, dumping waste. Um, all of those things are leading to a loss of life and biodiversity on our planet. Um, so, for example, land use in terms of uh agriculture changing a forest i mean that's partly deforestation but changing a rainforest to produce palm oil is a different type of land use which is changing the biodiversity of that area um if we're quarrying for rare earth materials or oil you know these are all going to lead to the loss of life and f an extra thing to relate to that um is uh, peat bog destruction um so digging up peat which is quite a good uh, fuel um leads to production of CO2, but it also is leading to a massive loss of biodiversity. Deforestation is an obvious one. Obviously, we're, we're cutting those down not to produce paper. We're cutting it down to either grow soya for agricultural use in feeding animals um, or for space for growing cattle itself or for growing rice fields. Um, or we might also be growing crops for producing biofuels. So we might be growing sugar cane so that we can produce alcohol, uh, not to drink, but to use as a biofuel. But again, it's leading to the loss of the original life that was there, which is usually rich in biodiversity. And finally, global warming. Um, global warming is obviously producing, uh, where well, we are producing CO2 um, and methane. And both of those, as you know from chemistry, um, both of those will basically sit in our atmosphere um, and cause the absorption of radiation that's released from the earth that's been absorbed from the sun and that's going to re-radiate it back to the earth again leading to a, a rise in global temperature. Those gases are already there, we need those a little bit in the atmosphere to keep our atmosphere nice and stable in terms of temperature but we're increasing those levels of those gases and so the temperature therefore on average is rising. Now we are doing a few things that are going to help maintain biodiversity, um, a few things that we're trying to do to counter these changes. So we're of course trying to, to reduce deforestation um, and CO2 emissions. We're trying to prevent that through smarter use of, of um, for, fossil fuels in cars and in factories and things. Uh, we're trying to get more en energy um, renewable energy sources that don't use fossil fuels for example. We're trying to replant um, forests we're trying to protect and regenerate habitats um, so that we are letting animals that already exist survive. We're also using breeding programs. Um, there's lots of controversial views about 
certain types of zoos, but a lot of zoos in this country at least um, have fantastic breeding programs which try and increase the biodiversity of a species that's endangered and those can then be potentially re-released -re into the wild. Um, so lots of things that we try and do in terms of land use and, um, and land pollution, water and air pollution, we're trying to find smarter ways of recycling resources uh, rather than just sticking it out into the atmosphere or into um, the land or into the oceans. We're trying to find a better use of, of it all. So we know the problems, we know what we're doing to the world, and we're trying to get better at minimising their risk. And the final area of this topic for us to look at is the element of food production and how we can access food security. It is biology only. And food security is making sure that the whole population of the planet has enough food to feed them. Um, now we're in quarantine at the minute and that's quite an important issue for the country to think about. Have we got enough food to, to feed the population? Which we do. Um, across the whole world we're at risk because um, we've got increasing birth rates, we've got in changing diets which is moving to um, elements of things like more meat, we've got issues of pests and pathogens which are infecting our crops. We've got environmental change, which again is affecting our crops, essentially leading to a decreased yield in our crops, which means how much we get. We've got an increased cost of agriculture, um, and we obviously then have conflicts, which are war as well. And all of these th things put our food security at risk. Okay, so we have a few solutions that we're working towards that we have. Um, and mostly this links around how we're producing our food. So the obvious one is how we work our agriculture. So for example, with agriculture, we could limit movement, we can control temperature, we can um, try and reduce energy loss for farming animals. Um, for feeding, feeding them, we can give them higher protein, high protein food. Um, basically, it's moving towards the the less ethical type of farming, but it's a more efficient way of farming. For other types of agriculture, we can look at um, using crops again that are producing high protein, high nutrient values, which are cheap to grow. Um, just again, being smart about what we're growing and how we're using it. You know, not feeding uh, people with exotic foods that cost a lot of money to, to grow, a lot of time to grow, things like that. The other, uh, on other related note is fisheries. So rather than us growing food on land, we take fish from the oceans and rivers. Um, fisheries are at risk at the moment because we're overfishing. So we're putting in uh, restrictions in net size. And we also have uh, fishing quotas, which is a limit on how many fish we can actually take. F fishing with a certain net size is handy because large fish get caught. So adult large fish, mature fish get caught the little um, kind of younger fish that haven't yet been able to have offspring and things aren't caught. So we're helping their population to become sustainable. And having a quota just means that they can only bring home so many fish um, on a fishing boat, which is difficult for a fisherman if they find a good stock. Um, but it also means that they're protecting the population of fish in that area. And biotechnology is the most interesting position or place in biology at the moment. I would say because uh, we're able to do genetic modification of crops, so GM crops, and we're also able to produce mycoprotein, uh, which is a really well-sourced type of food. Uh, you find it in things like corn. And mycoprotein is made using a fungus called fusarium, which you need to know the name of. Um, mycoprotein is just the same protein that you would get from animals, um, from plants, but it's produced in a lab essentially uh, for quite cheap and it's a very good alternative uh, very cheaply made and genetic modification of crops and animals as well can lead to um, increased yield also can lead to us enabling them to become uh, herbicide or pesticide resistant and we can also manipulate the plant to um, produce vitamins in parts they would normally they normally wouldn't for example um, golden rice the plant has the ability to produce vitamins in other parts of its plant but not in the rice grain and so we've manipulated uh, the, the plant to produce rice with more vitamins in it. <laughs>
uh, it's clever. So again, it's nice that we're looking at problems that exist and that are arising, like food security, but we've got solutions that we're working to um, to try and solve problems. I hope that's been helpful. Um, do like and subscribe, hit the bell so you know when I release more videos. Um, and if there are any other areas you want me to focus on more, um, I'm very happy to. Just let me know.